Our first speaker sits <coughs> on the executive board of one of the largest and most iconic advertising agencies in the world. He's responsible for maximizing the organization's commercial success while simultaneously nurturing the team to provide creative excellence to their international client base. Not only does he achieve these sometimes divergent objectives, but he does so, as you would expect from an advertising man, with considerable style and panache. Simon would have me believe, despite the relaxed exterior, that there's much frantic paddling going on beneath the surface, but frankly, I think he's just trying to make me feel better. Simon's company is essentially concerned with helping world-class organizations to use innovation and creativity to achieve even greater success, and I am delighted that he has agreed to share some of his insights and opinions with us today. Would you please extend a very warm welcome to the very chilled Simon Francis. Thank you. Yeah, I was feeling quite chilled, actually, about speaking to you and excited about the opportunity until just before I came out of the office and I saw a young uh, American-Polish guy who works for me in media innovation, so he's an innovator. And he said, so, where are you going off to, boss? And I said, I'm going to go and speak to about 300, 400 sort of guys in technology and, you know, IT and everything. And he goes, do you know anything about it? And I said, no, nothing, nothing at all. I have no, no clue at, at all, really, about what these guys do or how they think or anything about it. And he said, dude, you are so totally dead. They are going to eat you alive. They're going to make you into their squeaky toy and leave you crying. So I was, wasn't quite so happy. And I said, so what are you going to say to them? And I said, you know, full of hope and optimism, having done my speech and everything. I said, well, what I'm going to do, say is that for sort of maybe 15 years, sort of technologists, IT, CIOs have been the drummer, if you like, in the rock band that is business. And there's a fantastic opportunity to step forward and become the lead guitarist. And he looked at me in the eye and he goes, well, I might stall him, but I still think you're fucked. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to see. Give me 15 minutes and we'll see how uh, we get on. So my profound insight into technology and how it's changing the world is limited, okay? But the thing I'm going to sort of start off with is that um, technology has fundamentally flattened the world for all of my clients that we work with, okay? It's made things fast. It's made things global. It's the fact that uh, you can have a catwalk a catwalk fashion show in London, okay, it's beamed across into a factory in India with designers and the products are then made, designed, shipped, manufactured and back in Zara's shelves for in three weeks. Okay, so it's gone global within three weeks. It's flattened the world in a way that we could never uh, I imagine. So what are the implications for all of the businesses that you represent but also represent my uh, sort of clients? I'd say it's really, really important to be first-ish, quick, fast. Very important to be fastest when you're moving in whatever it might be. It doesn't matter whether you're in ITV or whether you're in electronics or any of the different clients here. You've got to be super quick uh, to market and develop your programs. You've got to go the furthest. Now, that might mean into sustainability. It might be in services. It might be in the way that you apply your skill. You have to be profoundly deep. And there are many companies that have failed in some of those things. And having just lived through with Toyota, uh, a bit of a hiccup in their uh, sort of progress. They hadn't gone as far as they could have done in all aspects of their business. There's nothing wrong with the cars, but they just didn't respond very well. And uh, you can see how they've uh, struggled recently as a, uh, as a result of that. The other thing is, of course, you need to be the freshest. When you get hot, you get hotter. Apple being a good example. So being cool is really, really important. So I think if these are the things which are going to change business and take advantage of a flatter world, what is behind all of this? And I think it's innovation. Okay? I think if you, all of you are going to move from potentially being a drummer into being a lead guitar in your organizations and shape chain. Innovation has to power all of these areas. It's not about scale. It's not about resources. It's not about cash. It's about uh, ideas. So I'm going to talk to you about something I know a little bit about, having studied a number of your companies from a marketing angle and having worked at Saatchi and Saatchi and other companies like it, which is about building an innovative uh, sort of culture. 
I think you need to be the change that you want in your companies. And as Simon said, you have to lead uh, the change. You have to be inspirational leaders of, uh, of change. At the moment, the conversations that I see, someone might come to you and say, I need 15 million from you. That's not actually the conversation that needs to, or the problem that needs to be solved. It's like, I need 50 million more sales. 50 million more sales is where the innovation comes in, and that's the role that I think IT and technologists should be playing. So I'm going to give you some random rants and tips that I hope might be useful in your quest to change your culture into an innovation culture, and to give you some ideas from my world, if you like, that might be important. The first is, it's your job to innovate. It's not some marketing plonker, it's not the FD, it's no one else, it's your job to shape the change, okay? You have to step up. It starts uh, with you. Lead. Reach out to the other departments, okay? You go first. I think you're uniquely placed to do it. If I was starting a business now, I was talking with William earlier, one of the key hires I would make very, very on, of course, would be the CIO or the technologist, whereas a lot of our companies are working from behind that. So a couple of in inspirations for you. This fella over here, he thought that uh, superheroes were all very straight. So he wanted to be the first gay superhero okay, in uh, the universe. Now, now, whatever you think about his costume and his, uh, his mission, he innovated, he went first, he led. Now, I don't know whether he's going to be a success as a gay superhero, but I do think he will succeed in something because he's a leader, he's got a big picture, he's got a vision, and he's prepared to do it himself and get out and make it. So I would offer you to put that on your wall when you go back to the offices and use it as a source of inspiration. Seriously, you're laughing, you should. He's the sort of person which will shape a big change in his culture and in his world. If you can't quite do that, uh, shamelessly, I'm going to use my boss's boss. This is Morris Levy. He runs the publicist group that owns Saatchi and Saatchi. In 1971, he was hired as an IT director at the publicist agency, as it then was, uh, which was a radical innovation in its own right. And what he did is he uh, uh, built a computer system with the old magnetic tapes, and the company actually caught fire and bur was burning down, and he ran in and he got hold of the tapes, and the agency was up and running in uh, a week's time. Okay. And constantly, he has pushed innovation and innovation throughout the company. Obviously, he's now he's the big boss, he's the CEO, some would say more important than Sarkozy in France, as a, a, as a leader of change. He continues to innovate, and our company has now got more digital than anyone else and stuff like that. So whichever way you see it is be the change yourself that you want to make. The next I would have is hire hungry uh, people and do it in, in an innovative way. So we're an advertising agency, we get loads of grads in every year. We used to send them forms. We thought, hang on a second, we want digital natives. So what we did is we went out and we put a little thing up on Facebook. You won't be able to see this, it doesn't really matter. And we said, right, first of all, get as many friends as you can. Go off. If you get loads of friends, you get through the first stage of the recruitment uh, process. So some people, some girls, took their tops off and got 40 blokes. And, you know, all sorts of different crazy things happened. The winner got 252,000 friends in six weeks, okay, by running an Inside London Facebook group where you get the best pizza after three in the morning, okay, the best graffiti in town. So we said, well done, you're through. Come into Search in Search as a graduate trainee. She went, nah, I've got venture capital funding. Thanks very much. <laughs> so I wanted her in, but it's not just enough to have hungry and innovative people as part of your culture. You have to have an innovative purpose. If you go into your organizations, go up to the first person you see who works for you tomorrow and say, what's your mission? Okay, what are you trying to achieve? If they say, I'll look after the servers, boss, you probably aren't changing the company okay, in the way it is. Our mission is very simple. Nothing is impossible. That's what we offer to our clients. It's on the front doorstep. It's, it's in every piece of our appraisal that we do. Are you doing the impossible? That's a key part of the appraisal. It runs throughout our culture. So have that purpose. Make sure everyone clearly identifies with it and can line up against it. Clive Woodward, for example, when he won the World Cup, he got his players to set the rules and the values for what they wanted to achieve and how they wanted to do it. 
Okay, so it was a, another way of doing it. Nike salespeople are called Ekins. That's Nike spelt backwards because they're supposed to turn everything on its head. It's a clear mission uh, of innovation within that particular uh, field. So go back to the ranch, ask them, and you might be surprised as to whether they're innovating or whether they're managing the service boss. The next thing is, of course, to create a stimulating environment for work that encourages and rewards innovation. I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, slides that I took on my berry as I was walking around the office uh, this morning. So you can see a little bit of the environment that we create to help us create innovative ideas. Some of them are good. This is a, uh, some of the creative team's things. We encourage this shit, would you believe? But this is just the way it is. And of course, you can't stop them. That was once a white plastic seat and someone decided to just change it. So it doesn't matter where you go in one of our agencies. So what are yours like? Have you got grey carpet and grey cubicles? Are you innovating uh, and encouraging it? And it can go absolutely everywhere. This is the fridge where I get my milk every morning and this is the cleanest version I've ever seen of what people have spelt out. It's just stuff to help encourage people. Get the language right. Okay, language starts revolutions. If you take it from politics, I have a dream. Better uh, dead than red. Yes, we can. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids will you kill today? The language shapes cultures and innovation. The language in technology is shocking. Okay, I'm sorry. This is a chart that I've made and researched extensively. Creativity up one axis. Absence of acronyms, you can see the way it works. Now, breaking my own rules, you'll see that the source here is an ABA. That's another bloody acronym. And the source is MIU, which if an ad man ever puts in front of you a chart with MIU in it, it means made it up, okay? <laughs> Get rid of acronyms. Seriously, you know, it's stifling. It's a stifling environment. Use language that your mum would understand. Push it through the organization. Get a good mission and a culture uh, that rewards things. Right, now I'm afraid there is a bit of audience participation here for you. I've got a prize here for you. I'm going to make you feel what it's like uh, to be an innovator. Okay, very, very briefly here. In your packs in front of you, you'll see this. There is a letter from Simon to you, and I'm afraid, Simon, I'm going to trash it. What I want you to do is very quickly, because I'm already going to run over time, I want you to write your name on it, please. And you've got about 45 seconds, so be hasty. And I want you to build a boat out of it. We get the prize, people. You get the prize. If you, ah, there's a, there's a boat. Fantastic. Fantastic. What's your name, sir? Tim. Tim. Uh, I want an aeroplane. That's not bad, OK? That's what happens. That, there's an aeroplane, OK, right now. Can everyone make an aeroplane? OK, everyone make an aeroplane. I'm sorry, I've just changed the brief. Make an aeroplane quickly. And when you've got it, if you can throw it forward. If they land on your head, throw them forward. I'm going to collect them for the prize. This aeroplane. Why isn't it bigger? Why is it bigger? Yeah. It was a boat to start with. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not very good, though. It okay, didn't fly very well, Bjorn. Okay, now you're realizing what an innovator feels like, okay, when someone just picks it up and just thinks it's rubbish, actually. And in fact, if you're an innovator in most of our cultures, this is what it really feels like. Okay, this is what it really feels like to be an innovator in most of our cultures because you come up with an idea and someone just says, no, you know, that's actually it's worse than rubbish. Okay, and we have a culture of killing ideas, okay, just absolutely destroying them in our organizations. And so what I want you to do is I want you to think about changing your culture to having an angel's advocate approach to feeding back ideas. There's a big difference between saying... Why isn't it bigger? Why isn't it folder? It's not very uh, sort of good. And a different one saying, that's great. I could buy that, Bjorn. That's an amazing aeroplane. If only you could make it a little bigger. If you could add some color, I could really buy this. And what you've opened up is five or six different routes for further innovation rather than killing something. Okay? So think about your feedback processes with your colleagues, with your suppliers, everyone, to engender innovation. You have to be brutal on innovation. You have to kill some puppies. Okay. It's not enough to have lots of ideas or even a few good ones. You've got to have groundbreaking ones, big, hairy ones, okay? which means you have to celebrate only those good ones and be shameless about them. Also, you have to be brutal with people. Okay? You have to be brutal with your people. If you have a wet blanket, remove them. Okay? Just There is no time for it. Not everyone can innovate. Um, that it would be chaos, as you can see. Um, but you really have to be very, very tough on that and have performance metrics in place to allow it to happen. So anyway, that's me. Thank you very much.